everybody. This is the Way of the Wayfarer podcast. I'm Rodrigo, and with me is my good friend Perry Keeve. As a child, Perry Keeve stole a hundred dollars from his father's wallet and never told anybody. You delinquent, you. That never Dwight, happened. That's where your money went. And speaking of which, today we're talking about confession. There we go. Which Perry never did. <laughs> That was a lie, by the way. <laughs> Nothing like that ever occurred. He's lying about lying, <laughs> Dwight. Oh, my goodness. Barry. Yes. The reason why I wanted to do this uh, particular topic is because I've been reading the book of Psalms. I think I've mentioned this before on our mm. podcast. And uh, Psalms is a super interesting book. It touches over a whole lot of topics. Uh, and upon my readings, I... Uh, Happen upon Psalm 32, which I'm going to read here in a second. Uh, this, I feel like confession isn't a topic that we talk about very much. Sure. As a matter of fact, I can't remember the last time I ever sat at church or had a conversation with anybody, mm. particularly about the topic of confession. Right. Uh, generally speaking, I think most of us don't necessarily have a super enthusiastic attitude about the topic itself. Right. right. But... This is what struck me when I read Psalm 32, uh, was the fact that it made me think about all the other scriptures in the Bible that talk about confession. And the Bible overwhelmingly talks about confession as a positive uh, thing. Yeah. Like something that makes you go from like being really sad to being really happy. Right. Uh, you know, Ma like in Matthew 3, when... Uh, John the Baptist is baptizing people. People were confessing their sins before they got baptized. Uh, Acts 19 comes to mind, for example, right. where uh, that's the episode where uh, there were uh, some people attempting to drive out a spirit, and mm -hmm. the spirit turns, turns on them and attacks them, yeah. and they run away naked. And bleeding. And right, and then Paul drives out the demon and listens to him. Right. And as a result of that, like, people begin to see, like, oh, the name of Jesus actually has power. Right. And people come and confess their sins, and it right. talks about how... Some people came and burnt, uh, offered mm -hmm. their sorcery scrolls and right. burnt them publicly. And so confession is actually supposed to be a reaction to, I guess, A, you understanding your sin, and B, I think as a part of repentance. But like I said, the Bible always presents it as an, uh, as an overwhelmingly positive thing. Like right. this is how you respond when you sort of understand the weight of your sin. Mm. And the, the reason why I wanted to have this conversation is because I think, again, even though the Bible talks about confession in that way, I don't know that most of us right. feel like confession is an overwhelmingly positive thing. Right, right. So hopefully through this podcast, we'll be begin to correct that. Amen. So I want to begin uh, by reading Psalm 32, because this is the, sort of the the genesis of all of this. Right. And uh, here, here goes. Uh, Psalm 32, verse 1. It says, uh, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one who sinned, uh, whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me, and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are, hi you, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. And surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and brittle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing. Oh, you who have an upright heart. Hmm. I love this psalm. Yeah. I particularly love the fact that it's sort of structured in two parts. Uh, 
with a confession in the middle, and he talks about how like he was sapped out of energy and he was miserable, and then he confessed his sin, and all of a sudden he begins to talk about all this again, all these life right. giving things. Right. Uh, and again, I feel like we sort of need to change our attitude on confession because again, I think most of us think of it as like that's not something that I want to do. Right. Well, I guess my question would be and. And as I think about how we think about confession or how I think about it, the question would be, why do we frame it in that way? That it is something that is undesirable or something that we don't want to do? Like, what has taught us to see it as a negative aspect of our Christianity? Well, I think if I'm honest, and if I'm honest in my life, right, I think uh, there have been times, particularly two or three that I can think of, where... I admitted my fault, if you will, mm. in certain things. And so I think there's two parts to this. And, and let me get to, to this. Let me get to the story, and then I'll, I'll explain it. Mm. So, like, I, I can think of, of very three, three memorable episodes in my life in which I, quote-unquote, confessed. And that confession was received with a very strong... Uh, rebuke okay i would say and i think out of those three times i don't think any of them necessarily merited that okay and i think if i if fair i think it would be fair to say that most people who have a negative view of confession have it because they've had some experience like it okay you know what i mean so they do it and then it's it's actually not a life giving. Yes, thing. It's, it's actually a, an opportunity to be crushed gotcha. further. Gotcha. And so I think there's two parts of this conversation. There's a conversation of that we need to change our attitudes to coerce confession and see it as a positive thing. And there's the other part that I think that because we should just sort of uh, live up to the way that the Bible presents confession again as a life giving thing. Right then when we are on the other side of someone's confession, we should try, because I don't think that's appropriate every time. Sure. Right? But I think by and large, we should try to make it a positive experience. Right. Right. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, for example, if somebody confesses to you that they murdered somebody, like, <laughs> you should let that go. Right. You know what I mean? Like, that. Absolutely. That there should be steps after that that are not going to make life pleasant Right. For that other person that's confessing of murder. Right. But murder is a pretty big deal. Absolutely. You know what I mean? But what I'm saying is, like, it's not every day that somebody is coming to you. Hopefully and, not. Yes. <laughs> and confessing to you of, like, horrible, horrible crimes. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. I'm talking about, like, you know, somebody comes to you and they tell you that they watch pornography or that they lied or that, you know, there's... I, I, I do feel like there are degrees to these things. Yes. But... I feel like there's sort of the attitude uh, from many people that no matter what it is, because it's sin, we it should be it should be uh, treated with a hammer. Sure. Which isn't always necessarily the case. Right, and, and I even think the idea of a firm or a harsh rebuke, right? Like the only time you really see Jesus like going after people in Scripture, or people who one don't see their sin. It's not like they're confessing their sin to Jesus and then he's bashing them over the head saying, like, you guys are horrible. Right. It's people who are completely blind to what they are doing and Jesus is calling out their sin. Right. Like, hey, this is not right what you are doing. Um, the person who has the humility to acknowledge their own sin uh, and then to purge it, you know, uh, well. Uh, a part of purging it, I think, is the confession, Sure. right? Um, I think that person has arrived at a place where the sin has done its damage. Like, the sin will rebuke you. It, another person doesn't need to do it. The sin will beat you down enough. Right. Um, I think it's the obstinate heart um, and the unlistening heart um, that deserves a rebuke, you know, in, in the harsh sense. But I, And I do think there are a few other elements to the reason why people would see confession as negative. One, I, I think just with sin uh, and specific sins in general and the concept that we as Christians want to be holy, we want to be righteous, and we want to be seen that way, 
Like, there is shame that comes with sin. Uh, there is guilt that c- comes with sin. Sure. Um, and, and there is a fear of punishment that comes with sin. And, like, the guilt thing, you can't shake because you are guilty of it. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the shame thing, like, perhaps you should have some amount of shame, but it shouldn't b- turn into despair, right? right? Um, and the punishment thing, like... That is either unfounded or, as you mentioned, people have been through situations where they've tried to be righteous and tried to confess, but there is an unwarranted punishment that comes next. Now, again, again, somebody who, you know, is in blatant sexual morality and not trying to repent, like, I don't know if punishment is the right word, but the Bible talks about church discipline, then some things need to happen. But I even think sometimes... As a response to sin, people can be told things that they take as punishment when really, you know, it's like a diabetic who learns that they're diabetic. When the doctor says something like, you need to stop eating sugar, it's not now that I'm in sugar time out, right. right? It's not a punishment, but there are things I need to be doing in order to cure the illness. Sure. Uh, you know, one of the things that sort of uh, brought this conversation along, too, is last time uh, we, we – our last podcast – was basically about community and building community and making right. sure that church feels like a community. Mm-hmm. And I do feel like confession is a great tool mm. to build community. And especially, I think, if it's, if it's done with the right mindset. Because I think one of the, one of the worst, uh, I guess, attitudes that can sort of prevent a healthy uh, environment for confession is when there's this feeling that there are uh, people that are sort of like more righteous than you Mm -hmm. and the more righteous amongst us are the ones that get to like hear and react to all of the confession. Right. When I think like if we approach sin and confession with a great degree of humility... It really changes the dynamic mm. of of confession. You yeah. know what I mean? Like if if we all de- are departing from the from the point of like, listen, like we we're all sinners, right? And all of us sin, and none of us are adequately uh, righteous in a sense. Like right. I, I, you know, we all sin. Is all is all I'm saying. And right. I think if if we if we create it, if we create an environment in which like because I sin twice a week and you sin five times this week, then I'm better than you. Right. And then, so it, that puts me in a position to uh, to sort of like better judge your degree right. of sinfulness. And right. So when you confess, I'm going to be in charge of this conversation right. and I'm going to tell you how horrible you are. Right. Then you're creating an environment that is not prime right. for anybody ever coming back to you Absolutely. and telling you anything. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And so, like, I feel like... In, in in an environment, in a community in which we all understand that we're sinful, in which we all depart from the place of like, you know what, we all fail, and we're going to be compassionate with each other, we're going to show each other grace, and none of us is better than anybody, then like you're laying out a foundation in which like bringing up your mistakes and your shortcomings should feel like, hey, when I talk about how I failed, and when I talked about how... I gave into my weaknesses, right? right? It's going to be received with love and with fairness and compassion and grace. Then you're creating an environment in which confession feels like you just like took a huge weight off of your shoulders because the guilt and the shame that you were talking about and sort of like this sense of failure feels like it's relieved when you're able to tell your friends like, listen, I failed. Right. right, and it's received with, not with us like, well, you're a horrible person, <laughs> but more of like, listen, like we're all in the same boat. We've been through the same things. We can help you. Right, right. Which also, let me be be very clear because in this podcast we try to be very clear. I don't think that a compassionate, gracious environment for other people's sin is necessarily one devoid of accountability. Correct. You know what I mean? Like I think I think again, the Bible. Most of the time, when it addresses confession, what follows said confession 
is a great degree of repentance. Right. And I feel like when people confess and that confession is received again with compassion and care and all of those things and grace, uh, what should follow should be repentance. Yes. And I think there's two scenarios in which confession uh, can be very ineffective. When your confession is met with harshness, that can be very ineffective. But when your confession is also met with no accountability, mm -hmm. that also can be very ineffective because then the scenario that you encounter is like, hey, we're going to get together and just talk about our problems and nothing changes. Right. That being said, too, though, like I do feel like in some cases uh, that repentance just takes a long time. Right. Well, and, and I, I think – so I'm going to read the scripture um, in John 1 because I think a big problem – with that balance there, and the big problem with how people perceive confession um, is that they don't understand the purpose of it. You know, and, and, and kind of like in the other podcasts and the other kind of Christian things that we do, we can put them in this category of just obedience. Like, I know I need to do this thing. The right. Bible tells me I need to do it, so I need to do it. But without understanding why the Bible is telling us to do it, right. it becomes something to where it's like, okay, I know I need to confess, but if I don't actually want to repent and my environment is harsh, let's say that, then I'll confess, I'll get beat down, and then I'll teach myself or come to the conclusion that, well, maybe confession isn't really what I should be doing that much because I don't like getting beat down. Right. and I kind of want to hold on to my sin. Or it's an environment where there's no accountability. You confess, they pat you on the back, and you go back to doing the exact same thing. So in John 1, uh, this always challenges me. And I, to this day, and the Bible doesn't go into any more detail on this character. Um, but, you know, here's a whole situation. Uh, it's in John 1, 1, verse 44. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he's like, hey, we found the Messiah. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, Nathaniel's like, Nazareth, you know, can anything good come from there? I guess he don't know, don't know anybody like Nazareth. <laughs> uh, Philip says, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathaniel, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit or in whom there is nothing false. And, like, Nathaniel isn't even that much of a character throughout the rest of the Bible, you know? And yet there's this moment where Jesus looks at this guy, and he says there's, there's no falseness in him. There's no deceit. Right. And it's like, that should have been said about, it should have been the opposite, right? Nathaniel should have looked at Jesus and right. been like, this guy is completely pure, completely devoid of anything. He doesn't need to hide anything. anything. Or... He doesn't hide anything, you know? And I think as Christians, we don't recognize a lot how terrible sin is and how, like, it's not just bad decisions. Like, it is this ungodly force within us that if left alone and left in the darkness it grows and it festers and it becomes something that literally it consumes us from the inside out, rots us, you know? And so confession is, is not like, Hey, I did a bad thing. And so like now God told me to talk about it. So I got to talk about it. It's like, if this bad thing stays inside, right. you know, if this bad mindset stays something that is uncontested and unchallenged, if it, it if it's allowed to sit then I will become more of it, you know? And so confession is this opportunity that we have to purge ourselves of these rotting, living things inside of us that fester and grow and destroy us from the inside out. Does that make sense? Yeah, and actually you bring up uh, a good point, and I think one that is important to talk about in that I think uh, we usually tend to think of confession as like, This is my opportunity to bring up my big blockbuster sins. <laughs> like, and the reality is that that 
sometimes you don't have like a blockbuster sin right. week. You know what I mean? Right. Like this is not the big <laughs> mega release. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, but but I do feel like again in a, in a healthy community that promotes confession, I think it's confession is not just an opportunity to bring up your blockbusters. It's an opportunity to bring up the little things. Yes. And to bring up like the things that that we may not necessarily make a, a big deal out of, but because it is sin and because many times it is part of our character, right, in our in our sinful nature, right. I think we need to bring it up so that that character in many ways can be replaced with Christ. It right. can be replaced with, like, the spirit. You right. know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and, and again, I think we, we – and I think part of the uh, – part of uh, sometimes the culture of – confession that I think our society creates because this is the other thing and I think in, in some ways our society trains us this way right uh, what makes the news for example it's only the terrible right. horrible thing right you know what I mean right and many times it's like a bunch of small things that lead to that terrible yes. horrible thing absolutely and we never talk about that stuff and so like we we are basically brought up in a culture in which we think, that uh, the only wrong that we can do is like the blockbuster wrongs, right? And not necessarily all these other like m minor things that we think as minor, yes. but I think that God looks at and God uh, is grieved by your pride right. as much as it is uh, He is grieved by your bigotry or your arrogance, right. you know, your racism or whatever. Right, whatever. Like one of those. And I think it is important for us to understand, like when we're talking about confession. We're not talking about like, hey, like, bring up like this thing that you've been hiding for months. You know what I mean? Like, no, right. like bring up the fact that you might have like not been completely honest with your boss, right? Or that you know you acted in a really arrogant way to mm -hmm. one of your coworkers, or got angry with your wife. Yeah, anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and again, like, I feel like if confession is to be this this life giving, refreshing weight of our sh off of our shoulders right. type thing, we really need to train ourselves to to not think of confession as like the things that are going to make the news <laughs> but like we need to look at it as like listen like this this is how like i handle my sin yes you know what i mean this is how like i keep the people that are important in my life informed of my weaknesses that may not necessarily express themselves in these like super dramatic right like life shattering things right. but my everyday life shortcomings and yes. i think if we're honest we all have those right absolutely you know what i mean like all of us we all have those absolutely and so i i think this whole concept again a big part of it is people's lack of understanding of how how much sin is a tyrant, right? Sin is a, is a big problem. And so what we run into is like these, these sinful thoughts or these sinful behaviors. We know we should confess, but then there are many times. Well, so somebody who doesn't repent, right? And when we say we repent, we're not talking about uh, saying I'm sorry, right? We're talking about a complete pivot, a shift. You, you change your thoughts and your actions towards God rather than away from him. So somebody who lacks repentance their life will probably be full of two things. One, lack of prayer. Okay, if you lack repentance, you, you probably don't pray much. Um, and lack of confession. Now, um, if you don't repent in your life, if there's not consistent repentance, there could still be prayer and confession, but there is a, a very bad understanding of the purpose of both prayer and and confession. And I'm going to read this scripture in James, which is a scripture about prayer, right. but it brings up confession. Sure. Uh, in verse uh, 13 of James 5, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And you brought it back to the idea of the community and, and this idea that one, people have this mindset 
that they have to overcome sin by Listen. sheer willpower. Right, right, right. Right? Like, I just got to be good enough to stop sinning. Yes. When God never approaches sin that way, God is like, I am the one who overcomes sin. Right. I am the one who defeats it. You aren't strong enough to do it, which is why I've set everything up like I've set it up. And this is why every Christian, like there's no such thing as a lone wolf. You've got to be a part of a community or else you won't repent from sin. Right. Um, but, but in that community, there, there's two things. One, God, you know, John 17 talks about God wants to be known, you know, and, and, and wants us to know him, right? And wants to know us. And I think in the community, we need to treat each other like that. And I go back to Nathaniel being a man in whom there is nothing false, like that's the kind of relationship we should have with each other. It's completely vulnerable, completely open. We know each other, and then we contend with and for each other in consistent prayer. Yeah. And I guarantee a community that, that is founded on vulnerability, openness, grace, and compassion, and prayer will have tons of people who repent not because they're so righteous or because they're so disciplined or strong in their willpower, but because they are people who have learned to have faith and rely on God through the avenues that God has given them to rely on him. Yeah, and I think, again, I think in as far as uh, even the scripture is concerned, right? Like, if you never confess, Mm -hmm. like, how are people going to pray for you? Right. You know, and, and again, right. and, it, and it, you know, it's interesting because I do feel like you bring up a great point in that if confession is part of our community, mm-hmm. then confession strengthens your community. Right. Especially, again, if we see it as, uh, as something that is good Mm -hmm. because i think for a lot of us the departing point is like when we talk about confession it's a lot of hesitation right it's a lot of like i'm gonna have a really hard time doing that right right and i think the only way to combat that is to show (laughs) that confession is actually good absolutely you know i mean that we can some way somehow do this and feel like man like this was this was awesome Mm -hmm. um I do, I do think um, that there's there's a part of of this whole thing that calls us, in many ways, and for many of us, to be to be part of a really unusual community, mm. and at the same time, a really powerful one. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because like the reality is, is that for the the ninety nine percent of us, right? especially many of us who didn't grow up in a Christian household, uh, your mistakes, right, are are rarely received well. Right. Like, dude, like, it's funny when I think about it, uh, a, a good part of your childhood, and even especially when you get into your teens and you begin to get into a lot of trouble, a big part of your life is hiding stuff. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I did this, and how do I get away with it? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? As right. opposed to, like, I did this, and how, and I'm going to go tell my parents, and I'm gonna be, they're going to be, this, it's going to be great. Right. You know what I mean? And, right. And that is not, again, like, that's not what we're used to. Like, there's, there's nothing outside of a healthy Christian community. There's no scenario in which coming and admitting your mistakes feels like a good thing. Right. And so we're combating two things. We're po- possibly combating uh, our upbringing and sort of the just the, our general life in mm-hmm. general. And we're also combating maybe an, a, an environment at our church that's not necessarily conducive to confession. Right. And so I, I think in, in many ways, us changing our minds about how we see confession is sort of like a double-layered problem that we really need to make great strides to change if we're right. really going to build, like, a positive confession environment. You know, you really only have two kind of communities you can be a part of. One that is full of humility and confession uh, and, and effective, positive confession. Yes. Um, where there's grace and there's accountability and all those things. Or you have a community where there's arrogance, pride, and, and everybody's a liar. Because there is no Christian community – 
before Jesus comes back, that is going to be full of people who are perfect. The book of 1 John talks about this. Right. So the idea of being afraid of confessing sin is no different. And, and honestly, our society teaches us to do this than the idea of being afraid of telling somebody that you went number two in the bathroom. Like, everybody knows that everybody does it. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, if, if, if anybody from my ministry is listening to this or if you don't know me, like, I talk about poop all the time. <laughs> Because it is just a natural part of my life that I don't need to be ashamed of. Um, But, like, if God built in our bodies a mechanism to purge the waste, how much more and how consistently should we be purging the sin? Sure. And, you know, I'm the kind of guy, I'm pretty regular, go five to six times a day, so I should be confessing five to six times a day, right? Sin. I'm just throwing it out there that the Lord gives us patterns in nature itself. Right. <laughs> and we shouldn't be embarrassed about By these them, things, sure. you know? Well, let me read the scripture that you're talking about. It says, this is for John, I'm sorry, verse 8. It says, if we came to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the hmm. truth is not in us. Right. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we, can't, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. That's crazy. And... Uh, well, and, and again, there's two things here, and, and and literally this scripture is talking about sort of the two ends that we're talking about. Right. Because if if we are a part of an environment, if you will, where like we are claiming that this is like a completely pure environment, basically this is what I'm getting at. If we're part of an environment in which people uh, say that that there's no sin here, right, right. Uh, then, like, when there is, then it's a big deal. Right. Right? And and therefore, that sin needs to be, like, squashed really hard. Right. Because then we're saying that our environment isn't necessarily what we said it was. Uh-huh. It right. Was, right. Right. But if, again, but if we depart from the position of, like, listen, we all sin. Mm-hmm. And if we say that we don't, we're liars. Right. Right? <laughs> then, like, if we're all honest and we all say, like, you know what? We all sin. And because of that. What we're going to do is that we're going to confess our sin. Right. And what I love about the scripture that we just read, and my phone fell and I can't but make a reason to it. Fine. But what what this scripture says is that when we confess our sins, like it is God yeah. who heals us. Absolutely. And who helps us rid ourselves of right. all unrighteousness. Right. And I think if anything, right, confession is a way for God to really express his purifying power not only in us right but in our community absolutely like if you it, it like you said we can't rid ourselves as a community or as, or as individuals of sin by sheer will mm-hmm. we have to do it through the power of god yep. in this scripture what it's saying is that the way to do that <laughs> is not to say like there's no sin here right and we're all going to be righteous right it's to actually admit that we're all that we all fail, right? And therefore, we're going to confess our sins and bring forth the power of God. Absolutely. And I think even like uh, from a let me pick up my phone. That's fine. You know, even from a leadership standpoint, right? Like, like I think we all want to be able to say, "Hey, my ministry is righteous." Right. Right. We all want to be able to say, like, nothing bad happens here, and even like when we lead a group and something really bad happens in that group, like, we feel responsible for it. We Mm. feel like now, like, this reflects on, like, my lack of whatever. Right. Right? But again, like, I feel like from the get-go, instead of striving for, like, a flawless group, Mm -hmm. you strive for an environment of confession. Yeah. Then when something bad does happen, right, there is no panic, man. Right. Because... We've been saying all along, like, we are this kind of group, and right. we're only here right. because of God's grace, right? Right. And when we confess, when we actually talk about, like, the things that we fall short on, we're activating God's power to, to make this better. Right. You know what I mean? As opposed to, like, trying to, like, by really going after people and by really, like, rebuking them hard and by really, like, you know, addressing sin in a very harsh way, we think that we're making things better. Right. Right? But a lot of times we're actually going against 
creating the environment that scripture says yeah. is the way to rid ourselves of sin. Right. And and I'll say this, in the six years that seven years that I've been in ministry, the most egregious sins that I have seen and encountered have come after months or even years of these things being hidden and not confessed. Right. And then everything explodes, you know? And whether that says something about the kind of community that I've built where people feel like they can't or can confess, I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that, like, when we don't have a community that sees the power in confession, like, sin will succeed. Yes. Uh, and it will have the victory. You know, this this is good. This is really good because it just made me think of this, right? Because if we legitimate, and, and the thing is that we walk, we walk, we work in uh, in opposition to what I think w- would create a very righteous environment, mm. right? Because a lot of times, again, to put it very simply, through control, we try to create mm. righteous communities, mm. right? Right and and not and and I'm not talking about like control in 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 structure. Like I think I don't want to make it seem like I'm a hippie, right? I believe in structure. I believe that things should be organized. Sure. I believe that's not the control I'm talking about. Sure. But I'm saying like through through control, we try to build an environment that uh, is righteous, mm-hmm. right? When in reality, I think when we build an environment in which we openly say and we openly promote the fact that we're all sinful and in a way, not that anybody has license to sin, right? Right? But that we are uh, departing from the admission that we all sin and therefore the way that we're going to address sin is from a place of humility, right. grace, and compassion and we make that very public, right? Right. And we And we make it that because we acknowledge that and because we understand that, because we're being honest about that, because right. that's the truth, right. right? Therefore, we're going to create an environment of confession. Then what we sought to do with control, we actually get through honesty mm-hmm. and through compassion and grace and right. confession. Right. Because the Bible says that it's confession that actually <laughs> promotes right. righteousness. Right. And again, not necessarily through our actions, but through the power of God. Absolutely. And again, like I think a lot of times, there's so many things, man, that I think when we go uh, by human instinct, right, that we try to create a, a, a spiritual thing through human instinct, mm-hmm. that we actually are working against ourselves. Right. Because this is interesting, and we've been talking about the kingdom of God in many ways, mm-hmm. right? Because I feel like a lot of things in the kingdom of God work backwards yep. from what we're used to right uh we used to doing mm-hmm. so like in a from a human aspect right many times the more control you display and the more control you have the better the outcome right in many ways when it comes to the kingdom of god and christianity <laughs> the more you let go the more <laughs> of the outcome that you desire right actually comes but that's because we're allowing god to work as opposed to us getting in the way per se, right? Like a Chinese again, finger trap. Yes, and again, I think this seems very hippie-ish and like kumbaya, but but again, like I feel like scripture supports that Absolutely. in many ways. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And so, again, like I feel like instead of sort of creating this artificial righteous environment, mm-hmm. if we all depart from the place of like, man, we all suck, right? Like we all we 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 suck. Yes, and and we're gonna help each other. We're gonna hold each other accountable. Right. But more than anything, through confession, we're going to activate God's powers. Right. And repentance will come. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's a good place to end this. Sounds good. Hopefully, uh, what I hope is that for those of you listening to this, you have changed your mind about <laughs> confession. Amen. And uh, you will go and confess. Yes. And uh, if, uh, if this has been helpful in any way, or if you disagree with us, uh, or if you really like this, please leave a comment. And follow us. Uh, if you want to support what we do and become one of our Patreons, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Ether MMC. Uh, we do this podcast and another podcast called the Ether Podcast. Yep. Uh, the other podcast is more uh, 
theological and deep Bible. Well, not that we don't do deep, deep Bible here. <laughs> sure. But it's more theological in nature. So if you like that, go and listen to that. A friend of mine, another friend of mine called Ryan Novak and I do that one. And uh, thank you so much for watching slash listening. And we'll catch you on the next one.